So hi, hello and welcome again, my crop hunter here. And today I'd like uh, to answer a few questions that I received uh, from some of you, my viewers, either per email or also in the YouTube comments section. And I'd like to give you my take uh, on these questions. As a matter of fact, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven questions that I'd like to address today. Um, short questions, but sometimes the answer is a little bit uh, is a little bit longer. Yes, I'm just going to simply start uh, right off uh, and uh, here's the first one. Hi, Oliver. I'm kind of slipping out of my hobby microscopy. Can you please give me any tips on not to quit microscopy? <laughs> well, that's an interesting one. And as a matter of fact, uh, it is a question that I've already received before. It's not a new one. There are people out there, um, enthusiasts, hobbyists, uh, who have started the hobby maybe with great enthusiasm and after some time all of a sudden yeah interests start to wane off and other things become more interesting and maybe there's even a little bit the fear of of losing a hobby and uh, you end up doing it less and less and then sooner or later you end up not uh, looking through the microscope um, anymore at all so what is there what can you do that uh, can keep you motivated and I need to tell you the following. Well, actually, it is actually something normal, in my view, uh, to lose interest uh, over time if you've already gained enough experience and if you're not developing anymore. So it's a little bit like watching a movie in the cinema or on Netflix these days. You know, the first time it might be interesting, but if you keep on watching it over and over again, um, the most interesting movie is going to start to become, yeah, boring and dull after a time and I think it's uh, similar maybe also with microscopes if you keep on watching the same things over and over again and if then essentially you already know what to expect and then maybe um, things are not quite as interesting and exciting as they once used to be and for this reason I do have a few recommendations um, and one of these would be is, is um, try to find an area of specialization within the field of microscopy so for example maybe um, you have uh, certain areas of interest maybe you would like to observe of pollen under the microscope or hunt for tardigrades or I don't know um, a variety of different uh, um, uh, microorganisms that you want to specialize in and uh, if you observe them try to find them document them even maybe take pictures of them then you have uh, certain goals that you can set and you can come become an expert so what you're doing or what you have to do is, is maybe you have to increase the bar a little bit the level a little bit and keep uh, to keep yourself challenged and actively learning because um, I think this could be one of the reasons that that you lose interest is, is because you've already yeah, reached the plateau and you've only already kind of yeah achieved all of that what you can achieve at least within um, your area that you've been doing so far so you have to expand your horizons a little bit um, there are of course also online communities uh, that you can um, interact with you can share pictures with them and if you feel that you're kind of part of a larger community then this can also keep you a little bit uh, motivated I will tell you the following <laughs> yeah what I'm doing is I'm making YouTube videos and I'll be honest with you if I had not had or not found that area of applications I probably would also have um, yeah microscopy probably would have also been less of an incentive for me uh, but right now I'm actually now motivated and encouraged to do more and more uh, videos uh, for my viewers and this also keeps me um, thinking and engaged and also I'm thinking of, of new specimens that I can put under the microscope so you see I've uh, found another driving force so to say, to make sure that I'm engaged in microscopy. And I would like to simply pass on this experience also to you and maybe that you can also find um, some new driving force uh, that uh, encourages you um, yeah, to become, again, remotivated. Maybe get some books, some identification books and try to actively identify some of the microorganisms that you can find. There are so many uh, different things that you can do in microscopy and maybe um, yeah, you simply don't know yet um, of what, what the hobby has to offer as possibilities. Okay, um, but um, I would like uh, to move on. I did make a separate video on, on precisely that same topic. You can actually uh, see the link in the description below if you're watching this over YouTube. So can you please uh, take a look at a sample I have? This is the second question and I'm going to shock you with my answer. 
Um, and I'm going to explain you why I say it. And the answer is a very clear no. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to accept any samples from you to put under the microscope, not because I don't want to or because I don't value that. Um, as a matter of fact, I do feel honored. But the reason why I do not accept samples is because there might be some legal consequences. So you have to understand that um, if you're sending samples across the world, there are sometimes import restrictions for biological material. So if you're sending, uh, let's say, certain plants around the world, that's, that's not allowed all the time. Time. There are certain import restrictions because you want to limit the spreading of certain, let's say, plant diseases. Um, and uh, this is also one of the reasons why when you're in an airport and when you have any food material, you're sometimes not allowed to import it. And um, I would like to emphasize that this is uh, actually important. I know that some of you might now be thinking actually, well, these days with uh, global travel and all of the airplanes that are flying all across all continents and, and boats and, and, and so on, isn't there a lot of biological material already transferred or also maybe over wind and weather? Um, and sure there is, but still there are certain laws and regulations uh, that apply and that we have to stick to them. And uh, for this reason, I'm sorry, <laughs> interested as I am, I'm not able to uh, look at samples uh, that you send me. I love your videos, sir. So obviously question number three. I love your videos, sir. Keep up the good work. Okay. Oh, well, can you add the different magnifications um, in your videos um, in the corner? Um, this is an interesting question and um, it is indeed correct that um, in my main YouTube channel, the Microbe Hunter channel, where I present specimens uh, that I find and under the microscope, I I rarely, if ever at all, include magnifications in the corner. And the reason is, is because those magnifications can be misleading. And uh, they do take also a little bit of effort to make, but they can be misleading because the magnification that I put into the corner um, of uh, the videos, what should this represent? The magnification of the objective or the total magnification on your screen, which depends on your screen size, by the way, or what should it represent? And uh, even if I put now the objective magnification into the corner, sometimes label it with, I don't know, 10 times objective, then it does not mean that you're going to see it exactly the same way as I, because um, the field of view depends also on the sensor size of the camera and also on the resolution of the camera and on a variety of factors as well. So even if you use the same objective, you're probably going to see it at a different magnification. And um, to add uh, another level of complexity here, um, it is also like this that I sometimes use digital zoom um, in the video editing program to zoom in into the image and into the video simply to make sure that the specimen fills the whole screen because I want to get a nice, um, yeah, I want to show you nice videos. And then this changes again the magnification. So the only really meaningful thing for me to do would be to include a scale bar and in the scale bar we would then say, I don't know, 10 micrometers. But then what does this tell you? <laughs> okay, scale bars are meaningful, but then again, um, yeah, they don't really help you a lot um, either. Very abstract. What's 10 microns? Is this big? Is this small? If I tell you it's a hundredth of a millimeter, what does this tell you? Right? Um, so I would like to simply emphasize here is, is that uh, most of the videos that I make, um, you can also um, I make uh, using my 10 to 60 times objective. And this is also a magnification range that most microscopes are able to cover in, in any way. Uh, so, Yes, and of course, I have to say, I also made videos on this very topic. So, but let's move on. What do you think of the Dipple microscope? The D I P L E, the Dipple microscope. And I have to tell you, I didn't know what the Dipple microscope is. I had to do a little bit of research. It is a microscope that can be connected to your mobile phone for microscopy. And what, I'm, what do I think of it? Well, I think every microscope has its applications. And I'm also quite sure that this microscope has its uses. Um, it is not a microscope that I have. Uh, um, and uh, I just have to say, more from the technical aspect, um, if it has uses and if it's useful, then please use it. But um, we've uh, reached already the resolution limit with those microscopes that are, um, yeah, with uh, yeah, the standard microscopes. And if you really want to get the the, the best image quality, then you need a condenser, then you need uh, proper objectives. Um, and uh, in order to get the best uh, contrast as well, um, it doesn't work over cameras. You have to actually look through the microscope yourself and this will actually give you also the, the best and most impressive and clear image. Um, so generally cameras, um, even if they're pretty good these days, um, cannot really reach the image quality as looking directly through a microscope. 
Yeah. So basically, what's my opinion of this mic of the Dipl microscope? Sure, um, use it by all means. It will have its area of applications, uh, and it's uh, small and portable. And uh, maybe I'm going to have a closer look at it myself. But um, I think, um, yeah, it really depends what you want to look at and what your objectives are in the hobby. And uh, no microscope is perfect. Uh, neither is the one that I have. Neither are the ones that I have, um, because every microscope, to a certain extent, is a compromise in one way or the other. Okay, very good microscope and large microscopes are not portable. They're expensive. Small microscopes uh, might be portable, but might lack uh, might lack other features. Yeah, every microscope is a compromise, and uh, it's important simply for you to know what your own expectations are and what your own goals are, and then of course you can choose a microscope accordingly. So I'll move on now to the next question here. Can you do a video about how to become a microbiologist, please? Oh, this is a long one, and I'm going to quickly answer the question. Um, the short answer is, is, well, all you have to do is you have to get some training. Um, one possibility is, is to, to do a bachelor's or master's degree at university. There are also some colleges that offer that. Um, you can also maybe do other training programs. Um, yeah, I know that in the laboratory where I worked, uh, there were also people working there that did not study, but that were specifically trained to do routine laboratory work as well. So again, here it depends uh, quite a bit on, um, on yeah, what is available in your area concerning education. Um, however, I also want to say that, um, and that's maybe a little bit, I'm not saying necessarily a downside, but something that sometimes is not always sufficiently considered. Um, it, like in research, um, if you've got the training, you're very much bound to a laboratory and research infrastructure. So that means if you have the best training of a microbiologist, and if you're somewhere in a city, in a town, or it doesn't matter where, where there is no appropriate lab that employs you, then it's going to be very difficult for you to do your job. Because as a trained microbiologist, um, depending on your research area or depending on the things that you have to do, um, you need equipment. Um, and um, what are you going to do? Right, um, and so in that sense, there are certainly jobs and 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 uh, tr yeah, university studies out there that after you've graduated, maybe make you more independent um, of um, yeah, of a certain in infrastructure. You know, hospitals, of course, uh, are in many places, so that would of course be a possibility that uh, if you want to work as a microbiologist in a hospital, maybe maybe doing quality control or hygienics, maybe um, then of course the possibilities are much better, but if if you have a highly specific research interest or research field, um, sometimes maybe even trained with specific equipment that might not be available everywhere, well then I have to tell you it's going to become a little bit more difficult. I'll give you an example here from my own life. Uh, when I graduated with a master's degree in microbiology, I got an offer for a PhD program and uh, of, a, yeah, of a university professor. He approached me himself and uh, if I do not want to do a PhD with him. And I was of course happy and honored. Uh, I declined uh, for uh, other reasons, uh, but uh, in reality he wanted to, he needed someone who was actually able to operate a so-called a gas chromatograph. It's a pretty expensive technical device, but during my master's thesis, I was able to actually um, work this uh, device. Uh, I got I trained myself. I got training myself as well, but I really read into it and I got pretty good in using it. Um, but you see, um, now I don't have this device uh, available, so this training is pretty much useless that I had. Well, I don't regret having, having received this training because I've learned a lot. Um, but you know, you get the point, right? Um, sometimes, uh, especially with a highly specific specific uh, areas, you're very much linked uh, to the technical devices and to the infrastructure that you're trained on. So I would like to yeah, simply move on here. Um, I'm interested in seeing what kind of bacteria live in my aquariums. Are they the same? Is it drastically different between each tank? What is it like compared to the natural water? That's what I want a microscope for. Well, also an interesting question. I will tell you the answer is yes and no. Of course, there are certain bacteria that are going to be different because each aquarium tank is different and many bacteria are probably going to be very similar or the same because it's an aquarium. Um, however, I think that microscopes might not be the necessarily the best thing for you to di distinguish that. Because sometimes bacteria that are genetically highly related might look different, or the bacteria that look different might be genetically more related. It depends very much on the specific um, species of fish that are present. Um, there are a variety of, uh, of parameters uh, that influence that. Um, and um, yeah, 
ultimately I can already tell you what the answer is. <laughs> the answer is going to be there are going to be many bacteria that are the same and many of them that are going to be different and if you really want to figure it out then that will tell you a microscope is not going to help you very much. You actually have to do a DNA study. You have to um, simply go into the, you know, the environment there and you have to get a sample and you have to make a direct DNA analysis uh, to determine um, yeah, which bacteria are there because not all bacteria or only a small fraction of bacteria can even be grown in a laboratory for further analysis. So what you have to do is you have to directly analyze the DNA. But I think maybe this is not the main question anyway. You just have an aquarium tank and you would like to observe what's there. And I will tell you there are many of things, many things that you can observe, and diatoms, algae and so on. And uh, maybe some of them are way more interesting than bacteria. I also wanted to mention that. Yeah, Interesting question in any case, but uh, um, I would say that uh, uh, microscopes only will get you that far. What's better, halogen or lead? LED. Okay, <laughs> that's a very technical question. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm a little bit inclined to give a balanced answer here, but uh, probably these days you are probably going to go for an LED microscope. However, there are still very good uh, halogen uh, microscopes around and some people, especially people who have been trained on a halogen microscope, um, might still prefer them. I've heard that certain doctors, pathologists, who have been trained on a halogen microscope to observe certain stains of tissues, um, they still prefer to use halogen. But then again, a modern microscope companies now manufactured LEDs that resemble a halogen light or natural light much more. Um, so I would say that uh, hal uh, LEDs generally have probably more advantages than halogen. And one of the big advantages, especially if you want, if you want to do photography, is, is that um, uh, the color temperature does not change with light intensity in an LED. So in a halogen, if you make the light intensity lower, it's going to be more red, the color. And if you turn up the light intensity, then the color is going to be more blue. And so you have to do an, a white balance every time. Um, with LED, it's not like that. Uh, the color temperature is much more constant and also the light, light is much cooler. So there is less overheating of the specimen and less evaporation of water, therefore. So overall, I would probably say that uh, LEDs has certain advantages. However, that's also an important one, is this would probably not be a main criterion for me to choose a microscope. So if you have the possibility to get your hands on a good uh, halogen microscope, then please go ahead and, and get one. Um, I think there are other factors that might uh, play a larger role. Um, to a certain extent, it's also a little bit of a question of taste. So um, yeah, I would say um, there are other factors that uh, might influence your buying decision more, but with all things being equal, these days, probably LEDs um, have uh, a bigger advantage, okay? Yeah, um, what I'm going to do now is, is I think I'm going to, I think I'm just going to leave it at that again. I hope that you know, these type of uh, Q&A sessions, um, yeah, that you like them, please do leave your comments. Um, it's always important also um, to subscribe, not only if you're listening, listening over the podcast, maybe to the podcast or also the YouTube channel. I'm going to publish the video and the audio file on, on both uh, places. And uh, yeah, I think uh, I wish you all the best now. Uh, happy microbe hunting as always and uh, see you around next time. Bye-bye.